Welcome to Cutting Through the Noise. I'm your host, David Siegel. Each week, I game the system to bring you new ideas for a brighter future. Today, my guest is Robin Hansen, professor of economics at George Mason University. He's the author of several books and many papers on AI, prediction markets, signaling, and the future. A very basic question about governance and society is how can we develop institutions where, when there's a choice, we have good estimates of the consequences of the choice uh, that we can then feed into our values to, to make choices. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a decent mechanism to do this at a quite general level, which is called conditional prediction markets or decision markets. Uh, so let me give you an example. Yeah. One key choice uh, firms make is to fire the CEO. <laughs> They've got a current CEO. He might be doing well, he might not be doing well. Uh, if the CEO is not doing well, a good fix might be to get rid of the CEO and replace him with somebody else. Now, uh, that's a difficult decision. It requires a lot of judgments about the market and the firm and the in firm's culture and the other people they're working with. Um, but often, uh, there are people who kind of know that the CEO currently isn't very good, but who aren't very empowered to tell other people. <laughs> so you've got these shareholders. They kind of have to make the decision. But they aren't on the inside of these mm -hmm. gossip networks. They don't really know what's happening. And so it's very difficult to communicate the information of the people who know what's going on, that this guy, this guy's had some fallbacks, but he's really good and he should stay there. Or no, uh, he's riding on this past success and we should really get rid of him. He hasn't really added value. There's people who know that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people who, who need to know that. And then there's a failure to communicate, which is very common in our institutions. We don't know how to take the people who know things and find a credible way to communicate to that to the people who need to know. When you trade in an ordinary market, what you do is you look over all the different scenarios the company could be involved in in the future and say, in each scenario, what's this company worth? Mm -hmm. What revenue does it have? What prospects for new expansion, et cetera, does it have? And you average all that out to produce your current best estimate for the price. And if your best estimate is above the current price, that says you have an opportunity to buy and profit. If you think it's worth 25, the current price is 22, you buy at 22, you expect on average it goes to 25, you made three. You think it's too much, you sell. Either way. Now. Uh, that's an ordinary stock market. What we're going to do instead is make a conditional stock market. That is where the trades happen, but they're called off if a condition isn't met. And the condition will be whether the CEO is in office. So we'll make a conditional stock market where I, we trade, say, $22 for a stock. But if the CEO leaves office by the end of the quarter, that stock trade never happened. It's called off. We also make another market in the stock for money trade. But this market is called off if the CEO doesn't leave. So now we have two markets, mm -hmm. and each of them are basically uh, markets in this stock price, but they, they restrict the range of scenarios. In, in the initial stock market, you were considering all the things that could happen to the company. But now you're going to say, no, 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 I'm only going to consider the scenarios where the guy stays in office. Because if he doesn't stay in office, this trade never happened. So but it's a binary event that happens by a certain date. Right, exactly. By by whether the CEO the leaves date. by the end of the quarter. By a date. Okay. And, uh, if the CEO leaves by the end of the quarter, then one of these sets of trades will happen. And if the CEO doesn't leave, then one of the other sets of trades will happen. And in this way, when somebody trades in one of these stock markets, they're asking, how much is the company worth on average if we keep the CEO? And in the other market, they're asking, how much is the company worth on average if we don't keep the CEO? And these could be different prices. And if they are different, that's the market speculators telling you, I think the CEO makes a difference, positive or negative. And now you could just use that price difference as a way to decide, do I keep the CEO? So uh, one of the reasons that uh, in our current world that you're not always advised to tell the truth is that you get punished for telling the truth. Mm -hmm. There can be retaliation. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways these markets can work better is you can make a trade and expect to profit and nobody has to know that it was you who made yeah. the trade. Yeah. So uh, for, for example, uh, I've in the past, many companies have had markets on deadlines for projects. Often the person running the project is pushing the idea that we're going to make the deadline. And there's people down below working on the project who know, no way, no, we're not going to make the deadline. <laughs> but their incentive is to say we're going to make the deadline when there's a meeting. Because if they don't say anything, if they say anything else, the lead will punish them. And the lead can. And so the other people who are trying to find out will we make the deadline, they don't get the information from the person who knows because they're not allowed to say. Whereas if you have a prediction market on whether the project will make the deadline, then and you can bet anonymously, you can say, yes, of course, we'll make the deadline in the meeting. And then you can go bet and say, no way, we're not going to make the deadline through this private channel, which could then be more informative about whether we'll make the deadline. Now, I can see how this would apply to building a dam or a power plant or some municipal thing. And it involves trade-offs of time, of money and alcohol. Right. So I can understand that. 
What about more complex political futarchy scenarios? Brexit is this currently still controversial choice about the Britain's choice to leave the European Union. And the key question is, what are the outcomes people care about for Brexit? <laughs> We could have had a decision market quite easily on if we leave the European Union, what's the consequence? But the question is, what's the consequence? So now Brexit is an important enough thing. You can imagine a dozen different markets to track a dozen different, dozen different consequences and then not pick any one consequence per se. You could look at GDP. You could look at international respect. You could look at uh, leisure. You, you could look at lots of different things and ask uh, how it affects each one of them. Uh, and that could be fine as, as an advisory system. Uh, you might want to not make these things advisory. You might want to put more control over them, because when they're advisory, they require on the public to pay attention to them enough. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine a dozen markets on Brexit that told you all these consequences, and the voters just are not listening, and they're not paying attention. And so they don't actually use that information. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to cut out, if you want to overcome the problem of voter ignorance and, and inattention, mm -hmm. then what you might want to do is make a system where uh, there's this outcome we've agreed on, and then whatever the markets say about uh, that outcome, that that the outcome that the decision that produces that outcome is just th the thing that happens. Mm -hmm. and we don't have to go to the voters and say, "Were you paying attention? Did you notice?" It, it just happens. Mm -hmm. So for that, we'd the Britain would say would have to pick some overall measure that it, where it weighed these different consequences for GDP and you know war deaths and whatever thing else into some overall measure. So that's a possible solution. Um, in, under the slogan Futarchy, I've talked about that and say national welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, you pick something analogous to say the stock price for the firm. So again, for an ordinary firm, a public firm, the stock price is a good aggregate measure about whether the firm's doing well. But for a nation, uh, it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. And you might have to just pick some weighted average of GDP and international respect and mm -hmm. lifespan and mm -hmm. whatever other things into some formula. Yeah. And then you just ask the markets, how does this formula do? And of course, what could happen is you might realize you missed something in the formula, and then you'd have to go argue about changing the formula, but you'd still get kind of close. I actually think for cities, uh, a decent proxy would be the sum total of all property value in the city. That's a, a good proxy for the, the quality of the city. We have lots of good ideas for reform. What we don't have is lots of good tests. What we really need to do is to try the, lots of these ideas out on small scales with real field tests and see how it works out, and then modify them as necessary to deal with whatever problems seem to occur, and then work our way up to larger scales. Mm -hmm. uh, start with a club, start with a church, start with a neighborhood, homeowners association, and work your way up to larger decisions. So for all the interesting reforms we have out there, that's the right solution, is to start small and work our way up for trials. But many people aren't very excited by the prospect right. of, of a reform of a homeowners association. Mm -hmm. If you tell them, well, this is how it would work for a nation, they get much more interested. <laughs> uh -huh. And that's why I'm telling you my vision for why we might, how this might work for a nation. Not because I think we should jump first to doing it for a nation. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Give us the vision anyway. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. But I still want to give you the vision. So sure. um, the, the vision of Futarchy for a nation would be, we have the legislatures you're already electing, and they already are sitting there Mm -hmm. passing bills, but now all their bills are focused on how to measure national welfare. Mm -hmm. They all argue about how much trees should count, and how much art should count, and how much surveys of happiness should count, mm -hmm. and they put these all together into some formula, and then they argue about changing the formula, and that's their job. And so they produce this overall measure of national welfare, and they oversee some agency like the Bureau of Labor Statistics that produces measures every month, every week, uh, even geographic region figures that show how our welfare is doing over time. and then. Separately from that, we'd have the process for deciding which policies to change. Like, uh, do we change the tax rate? Do we ch change the zoning laws, etc.? And that separate process would use this national welfare measure as just the outcome it's trying to predict. So basically, we do like with the fire of the CEO, uh, there'd be a current set of laws, and there'd be an agenda process for proposing a new law. And when a new proposal law came on the agenda, what happens is we make a market in national welfare if we adopt that proposal, another market in national welfare if we don't adopt that proposal, compare the prices. And the simple rule is if the market price of national welfare is higher, That's if we adopt it, then we basically adopt it. But are these people elected who do this? Or well, how would you... There's, there's two sets of... I mean, there's three sets of people here. Okay. There are the electors who are choosing and modifying national welfare. Yeah, the, 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 pub, the, the politicians. Oh. I mean, we, we could change how it's done, but the simple 
thing is just to keep how we're doing it now. Oh. So you just keep the same politicians who are being elected to office, the same Congress people, etc. But now they pass bills that define and change how we, you know, define and measure national welfare. Does that's the, the first group. The public continues to vote bet. for those people. Anyone can bet. Right. So that's the that's the third thing, which is betting. Oh, okay. And when we have betting, anybody can bet. But we don't expect everybody to bet. We don't right. advise everybody right. to bet. But you have the freedom to bet on anything you want. Right. You can go to any of these topics and right. bet on it. But you know, you have the freedom to go bet on any financial market today, yeah. and you don't, sure. because you realize you don't know about all you these financial markets, and so you shouldn't. Right. Similarly, you can go bet on any policy mm -hmm. proposal you want, if you want to, but mm -hmm. you should be advised to really s stick to the things you know. Mm -hmm. And then there's, well, there's the a third category of people who make proposals. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'd just have a simple auction system where I'd say um, you have to pay a certain amount. You know, we have an auction for every time slot. Maybe we have one a day or one an hour for each new proposal. And you have to pay money to get on that slot. And whoever bids the highest amount gets that slot. Mm -hmm. And now your proposal, if you bid the highest amount, goes on the agenda. And now if your thing is passed, you get some fraction of the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if the market say this increased welfare by $10 billion, okay, maybe you get a tenth of that, one billion, maybe you get one percent, hundred million. Game, you, right, you, you get a fraction. So yeah. you now you have an incentive to search for proposals that mm -hmm. will be approved and that will produce bigger gains. And it will cost you to lose. Yes, of course, because you paid you pay. and you don't get anything in return, right. right. So that would be a auction. Anybody could uh -huh. bid for a slot in the auction in order to get their proposal on the agenda, but they better think it'll actually pass and make an improvement. Now, so, so the key idea here is that when you're trying to change the world, don't change everything all at once. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, uh, you, you might want to change everything, but you should still make proposals that change things one at a time because the world is just not going to listen and adopt your proposal to change everything all at once. So you should make a proposal that holds most everything else constant and changes something and try to convince people to change that one thing and then go to the next thing you want to change and convince people to change it. But make change one at a time, because that's realistically the only thing the world's ever going to do for you, sorry. But once it's working, how do we get rid of those elected officials in the voting? Okay, so, well, um, one issue, so, so what we're trying to, well, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do is to have a measure of value. How much do we all value different outcomes? Now, what we could do is just some weighted average of individual values, how much you value things, but how do we figure out how much you value things? Well, a straightforward thing is to give you binary choices and let you pick. Let me vote, or let me so we'll with my money. You mean. Well, sometimes we just give you things to let you pick what you get. So, um, there's a lot. So, say another thing might be um, imagine we sell citizenship to the country. Mm -hmm. we, we put a market for citizenship. You are a citizen, you could sell your citizenship and leave if you want. Other people can buy a citizen and come in. So, analogously to saying a city, a good proxy for a city value is the sum of all property value in the city, a good proxy for a nation's value might be the sum of all the bids of, for citizenship, right? The more the people are willing to pay to enter this country, <laughs> the more the country must be worth. Uh, and so, we, or we could add that to the property value. We can basically do some estimate of the total mm. capital value of the country, of all the things in it that you mm. could sell. Mm. And that could be a metric of whether or not a policy that is expected to increase the mm. total value of the country, which includes the citizenship rights of people who might buy in and the property that you might buy there, then mm. that's, a, that's a better country. That, that's an all, a different way than voting, you see. It's not crazy, but you can see people no. might be reluctant, and so you can see yeah. you don't want to change yeah. that proposal all at once, no, right? On the one hand, everything you know is wrong, and <laughs> it's all about signaling, and a lot is. <laughs> kleptocracy is the general accepted form of government, and all yeah, this yeah. stuff that we know is ridiculous. On the other hand, the world is a much better place than it was 20 years ago, right. and it continues to bumble along this sort of 2 to 3 percent right. line that just works. Two, there's two very different ways to evaluate the world. To have your idealized version of what the world should be, and then ask what the world really is. Mm -hmm. And under this form of analysis, you will slowly get lower and lower estimates and more disappointed about the world. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to likely start out with this pretty idealized version of what it should be, and you're going to find out it's just nothing like that. Right. It's, it's much, much worse. Right. And that's going to make you pretty depressed. Yeah. If you look at the world by reference to this idealized version that you might have started out with. Right. That's one way to evaluate the world. Yeah. Another whole different way to evaluate mm -hmm. the world is to look at where it was mm -hmm. and see where we are now and say, well, have things gotten better? Mm -hmm. Things are a lot better vastly better. And there's no obvious reason we're near it at any sort of limit or maximum at the moment. Things could get far, far better. And in fact, 
realizing how much below our ideals the world is shows you there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. It shows you that the world you look, so if you look around you, at least in our country and the people around us, people are okay, they're healthy, they're happy, they're, they're motivated, they, they got stuff they're interested in, they're not screaming in pain. Mm -hmm. You know, the world's an okay place. And when we look behind the scenes, we see how crappy all the systems are. Right. And so now we realize, well, if we could make those systems better, things could be vastly more productive. Yeah. We could have hospitals that actually make people healthy. We could have schools that actually teach people material. We could have political systems that actually make improved policy. Those are all potential things that could happen in the world. And surely they would take a world like the world we see around us now and make it much better. Right. Right. So the potential for on the upside is enormous. So when the world's one way and you want to have it another way. Sometimes you need to motivate people mm -hmm. to care enough to bother to do something. At that point, you need passion and drive and even a, a tenacious resistance and a defiance against the, you know uh, things that might get in the way. That's all great. But what you're shooting for, honestly, is a world where the new thing becomes the usual thing and then people don't think about it. The, the win scenario is that the world just functions and nobody really cares or thinks much about it, but it just goes on. So what we need are stable institutions where when you're not paying attention to them and you don't think about them, they can just continue. That's the win scenario. That's the win scenario. That's what you need for Pareto improvements in the world is to find changes in the institution that can just persist. You don't need everybody to love them and to be passionate about them. You just need them not to hate them and try to stop, change them so that they persist. And that's of things we have in a lot of our institutions. So think of cost accounting. Yeah. Who loves cost accounting? Nobody. Who sings ballads to cost accounting? Who makes movies celebrating cost accounting? Yeah. Nobody does that. But it was a wonderful improvement. Mm -hmm. And you realize, look, there's two equilibria. Mm -hmm. In a world where nobody does cost accounting, imagine you show up and you say, hey guys, let's do cost accounting. Mm -hmm. The message you'll be sending is, somebody's stealing money around here. We need to find out who. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be a welcome message, especially if people really are stealing money. Yeah. Those people will resist this. Right. Now imagine a world where everybody does cost accounting and you say, hey everybody, let's not do cost accounting on this project. Could we just not keep track of the money? <laughs> what you really be here to saying is, could we just steal let's the money steal and not money. keep track of it? Yeah. And that also will not usually be a welcome message. Sure. So you can see there's two equilibrium. Mm -hmm. A world without cost accounting, it's hard to get it going. Yeah. And a world with cost accounting, it's hard to take it away. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my hope for prediction markets. You see, we're in a world where people don't do prediction markets. If you have a project with a deadline and you say, let's do a prediction market on this project, you know what you're going to be heard as saying? Mm -hmm. All these forecast people are making, this is bullshit. Right. <laughs> we need to cut through the bullshit right. and find out what's really going on. Right. That's not a welcome message. Right. Okay, but imagine a world where every project just always did a prediction market. Yeah. And you said, hey, let's not do a prediction yeah. market on this no, project. No. <laughs> you know what that would be saying? Is it, yeah, let's just ignore the fact we're going to be late and not keep track of that. Right. And that would not be a welcome message as well. So you can see there's two equilibria well. Mm. And that's the kind of thing you should be hoping for with all your reforms. Mm. That you, you make a change and then it gets entrenched and people wouldn't think of changing it. So you can turn your attention somewhere else mm. and let that improvement continue. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. Come to our website for a daily dose of reality. Become a member of our online community and join us here each week for another insightful interview from Cutting Through the Noise.